Chang San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Alphabet advances. Shares spike in after hours trading after the tech giant says it managed to keep its ad business growing steady in the second quarter. I spoke to Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat about how the search giant keeps it up in the midst of rising antitrust scrutiny. We will tell you what she had to say. Plus, Amazon falls. The e-commerce giant shares tumble after the company reports second quarter profit missed estimates. Third quarter profit guidance also a miss. And up in smoke, Juul's defense of its marketing policy goes poof. The company's grilled by lawmakers in Washington who say more teens are getting hooked. But first to our top story, a tale of two earnings as both Amazon and Alphabet report second quarter results. Shares of Google's parent company jumping in after hours trading Thursday while Amazon's are heading in a different direction. Alphabet reported revenue for the second quarter that beat the highest estimates, calming concerns about slowing growth at the heart of the largest digital ad company. Meantime, sales in Amazon's vaunted cloud unit AWS grew by 37%. But that wasn't enough to top estimates either. Joining us to discuss in New York, we've got Forrester Research Analyst Colin Colburn and Estimai CEO Lee Drogan. Joining us via Skype in San Francisco, Jeffrey's Analyst Brett Thill. Uh, Brett, you cover Alphabet and Amazon. So what's happening here? I mean, Alphabet was just such a bad Q1 that it was uh, pretty easy to snap back from the disaster they had. Uh, they put a, a great number up. Uh, they uh, upped the buyback, uh, added an additional $25 billion. Uh, this is one of the cheapest large cap tech names we cover. It was definitely the worst sentiment going in of any tech name we cover. It's definitely the, the, the least transparent company. Um, so I think given you know the Q1 blues, this is a little bit of a rebound. I'm not sure investors are going to treat this as a sustainable uh, recovery. Uh, I think there's other names that, again, investors have been attracted to. This stock is really lagged here today. Uh, it, it deserves to bounce back. Uh, and it's good to see them step up and actually put uh, some of the capital uh, back in the buyback, which they really have been kind of slow relative to other tech companies on the buyback. Right. Shares were up about 9% so far this year. Before this earnings report lagging big tech peers, I did just get off the phone with Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat uh, talking about the growth drivers. She said they've been very focused on properly investing to support growth across the business. And she also said there was real strength in the other income and expenses line item, which we saw uh, go up to almost $3 billion. That includes capital and GV, given the IPOs that occurred. Now, that's the first time I've heard her mention or refer to their investment investments in Uber and Lyft, which of course both went public in the quarter. Colin, you know, talk to us about the overall story. Ad revenue growth did increase 16% compared to 15% last quarter. In prior quarters, it's been in, in the low 20s. So is this just a new normal? I think it is a bit of a new normal, but the good news for Google is that um, they were able to stop the decelerating uh, ad revenue for the first time in, in about a year. Um, so they were, they're able to increase that a little bit. Um, but you know, I, I think the the story remains from from last quarter, which is just that the digital advertising ecosystem is significantly more competitive today than it was even a year ago. Um, obviously, Facebook and and, and Amazon uh, being the new entrant um, as the third largest uh, digital advertising company that's out there for for advertisers to put their dollars into so I think there's just more competition um, and and that's what's kind of feeding this this new normal uh, that, that that we're gonna expect when we look at uh, Google's earnings going forward so Lee talk to us about the bigger picture here as these companies Alphabet Amazon and of course Facebook face antitrust scrutiny the DOJ has opened a review into big tech in general hasn't been specific about the companies the FTC has opened a review antitrust review into Facebook Specifically, you know, how are these? How is this antitrust scrutiny, this regulatory scrutiny, going to impact the bottom line? 
Yeah, so two points here. One, basically, when you look at about a year ago, what happened to Facebook uh, and how the market reacted to some questions around whether the regulatory environment was going to hit their bottom line, whether the top line was going to flow to the bottom line like it used to. We saw the stock get hit, and then as that kind of abated, the name has kind of you know surged. The same exact thing happened to Google last quarter, and it was partially because investors were a little bit worried about what was going on with the YouTube algorithm algorithm, the, the tweaks that they were doing there. Um, and we saw this quarter, obviously, that it, it's not going to have a long-term impact. And you're going to see the stock, as, as you are in the after hours, uh, surge here. The other aspect to this is Google has a history for specifically the antitrust reason of basically being able to ratchet up and down uh, exactly its growth as it wishes. Um, this is not a surprise at all that they blew the numbers out of the water here. Yet, yes. It looks like some of that is from the other parts uh, business. But the, the basic ad rev business is incredibly strong. Uh, the cost per click numbers were really good. They came in above the estimated consensus numbers. Um, you know, the, the, uh, some of the other internal numbers were a little bit weaker. But overall, they have the ability to just turn the knob at, at will each quarter. And they will be able to do that going forward. Well, and there were concerns about YouTube in particular because of all the scrutiny. They've changed some of the algorithms, limited recommendations, changed their policies around hate speech. But Porat told me that YouTube was still the second largest driver of revenue. Um, in talking about antitrust, what she said was that the DOJ's review, to her understanding, would be quite broad. And then she also talked about how you know, we've been engaged with regulators around the globe for quite some time. There are areas where we've been very clear. We support changes in regulation, U.S. privacy legislation, international tax law. So she sort of indicated, Brett, that this is normal. This is Google's normal state of play to be under pressure, to be dealing with regulators. It is not a distraction. How worried, though, are you for whether it's Google or Amazon or Facebook about this regulatory pressure? Yeah, they, they, as, as you said, they've been here for a long time in this situation. The way that I look at this is basically they're going to have to, all three of them are going to have to deal with this going forward. But if you think deeply about uh, the ability of our legislature's ability to actually uh, put any real legislation on the board here that's going to matter, it just won't. What it will do is it will pressure all three companies at the margin to make small changes uh, that could actually have you know a decent impact uh, positively in a, in a social way but you're not going to see them break up Facebook you're not going to see them you know crush Amazon's dominance uh, in the retail space and you're not going to see them really do anything to Google that will have a, a massive impact from a regulatory standpoint um, but the pressure is warranted um, all three companies deserve to be uh, under pressure here they are huge and and uh, there's no reason why they should go, uh, you know, w without that kind of oversight. Brent, do you agree? Microsoft was a $30 stock when the EU was investigating them. It's 140. Th this is noise. It's total noise. And the reality is what your last speaker just mentioned. It's effectively broad reaching uh, across all of tech. The government is doing what they should do to protect us. Okay. It's just like any other aspect of life. Uh, I think, you know, we face this in financial services forever to make sure we do the right thing for our clients. So it doesn't mean because there's an investigation that they're wrong. Uh, being big is not bad. Being bad is bad. Uh, we don't think anything's going to come out of it. And I think, you know, this is great because these stocks have been pressured. I, I travel globally and visit with institutional investors. It's the number one question. And these stocks have been suppressed. Software has multiples. There are multiple turns higher. So we think there's actually room for multiples to go up. We've been uh, have a very strong view that that the big platforms in the internet are, are great buys at this current level. So, Colin, what are the headwinds then, in your view? You know, I think I think the headwinds are really. Uh, if it goes back to competition uh, for a minute, um, when you look at the digital advertising um, market, it, it's just growing. The pie is growing as as Amazon is bringing in dollars from offline advertising. Um, so you have CPGs who have traditionally spent a bulk of their money in um, in store uh, placement, whether it's shelf space or um, FSIs that they're that they're investing in inside the retailer, bringing that onto Am onto Amazon's advertising platform. 
Uh, Facebook obviously growing the pie as well, and Google is too. The only problem is is that Google is just losing share slightly. Um, they're not they're not uh, losing share at an enormous pace. Um, but I think that it's it's really the competition I think that is going to be the biggest problem for Google's ad business going forward. Specifically because Amazon's creating a really interesting uh, ecosystem right now. If you look at the way that I just mentioned those shopper marketing dollars and trade marketing dollars coming online, that means that retailers like Walmart and Target and Kroger, some of the nation's largest retailers, they're, they're actually right now scrambling to figure out how do we make a self-serve ad platform just like Amazon. So now Google and Facebook are going to have to compete more against retailers. Um, I also am kind of a bigger believer in Pinterest too. Um, I know they haven't had a, a huge success story yet, but um, they, they, Amazon might pave a path for them to, to also get into this game in a, in a bit of a more um, substantial and, uh, and, and real way than they have in the past. Well, Pinterest did have a pretty big IPO, so uh, I don't if that's not success, I don't know what is. <laughs> uh, Colin Colburn of Forrester estimizes Lee Drogan. You're going to stick with me, uh, Brett Thill. I know you got to get on some calls, so I'm going to let you go. Meantime, shares of Tesla plunged Thursday. This after the electric car maker posted a worse than expected loss in the second quarter and another major management change cast more doubts on its future. Tesla co-founder J.B. Straubel is leaving the chief technology job. He has been with the company since before billionaire CEO Elon Musk joined the board 15 years ago, a decade and a half. Coming up, Alphabet shares advance in after hours trading after second quarter sales and profit beat estimates. We're going to dig further into the highlights. We're listening to the call. We'll bring you more headlines as we have them. This is Bloomberg. Back to our top story, Google having a bounce back quarter that saw revenue top analyst estimates. Shares from Google's own online properties, including search and YouTube, climbed 18 percent to more than $27 billion. Remember last quarter, Google missed Wall Street revenue expectations and saw its shares plunge. This time around, shares are feeling the love from Wall Street. Still with us to discuss in New York, we've got Colin Colburn, analyst at Forrester Research and Estimi CEO Lee Drogan. So I want to zero in on the cloud because Google Cloud has been uh, in third place for a long time now, though the entire cloud pie is growing. They've made a CEO changeover. They've replaced Diane Green with Thomas Curian. Uh, Colin, what are you expecting when it comes to Google Cloud and how important is it going to be for the business, given that they haven't been able to um, beat Amazon or Microsoft in terms of market share? It still is an important business uh, for Google. Um, it's obviously not the core at all, um, but it's but it's an important way for for Google to diversify uh, their business a little bit. If you look at the if you look at the way that Google gets revenue, about eighty five percent of revenue at Google is coming from the ad business, and. I think, given the competition again that, that they're going to be facing, you do not want to be in a, in a spot where you have north of 80% of your revenue coming from, from advertising. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that they're going to place a bigger emphasis on, on the cloud business going forward. Um, how much success are they going to have? I mean, it, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't been able to get out of that third slot, as you said. Um, they're facing massive competition against uh, Microsoft and, and Amazon, who, ha who have had a lot of success and who do put um, significant behind that business so I think that uh, it'll be something that'll be hard to get out of that third slot um, but but still a significant part of their business that they that they will be focusing on going forward <laughs> So you wonder if acquisitions will be part of the story to beef up the cloud business. They did buy Looker earlier this year, and I did ask Ruth Porat if acquisitions in cloud specifically would make sense. She said, we're open to acquisitions where they make sense. There's a lot we're doing organically, and we're excited about the opportunity. So she, at the same time, she said they're still interested in acquisitions. She also said the organic business is doing well, but it is certainly interesting, given the antitrust scrutiny, Lee, that Google might... Um, uh, hesitate to do more acquisitions, certainly in the near future. Is that what you'd expect? Actually, I, I think the cloud business is important strategically for this reason. Look at what Microsoft just did with OpenAI, investing a billion dollars uh, in that 
I don't even know what you call it. It's not tech, it's, it's a company, but it's kind of a nonprofit. Um, it, and I, I think Google will look at their cloud business in a similar fashion where the technologies of the future uh, that will be scaled out, uh, obviously the cloud business is going to be important for that. And it is in a sense a platform for those new businesses. Um, so while Amazon will continue to push a lot of that cloud business uh, to the bottom line, and as we you know have seen today, uh, it's incredibly important to the stock price because it um, you know impacts CSOI uh, so heavily, uh, you know, and the bottom line EPS numbers. Uh, for for Google, I, I don't see it quite that way. I see it actually even more strategic to Google than it may even be to uh, uh, to Amazon. OpenAI, an artificial intelligence research company, as we refer to it. Um, Colin, let's talk uh, lastly about YouTube. Of course, there's been a lot of question about how YouTube's business can continue to grow. It is one of the uh, centerpieces of, of, of where uh, the scrutiny from lawmakers and regulators around the world is coming from, focused on hate speech, misinformation, fake news. YouTube has made a lot of changes. We've done a lot of reporting on internal turmoil at uh, the company uh, division uh, under under Google, and yet Ruth Porat was very positive about growth on the call with me today. She's echoed uh, some of some of the same things she said on on the earnings call um, with analysts. How do you expect YouTube to weather these headwinds, Colin? I mean, the the brand safety issues that that advertisers have are legitimate on YouTube. That's as you said, it's been something that's been under spotlight for a while. Um, Google hasn't found a more automated way to figure out how to monitor for those sort of things. It's a very manual, laborious process that they have in place where they're really you just using resources to monitor that kind of stuff. But uh, in terms of like headwinds when it comes to YouTube, I'm not really concerned. When you think about Google's package, you know, last year. A big innovation that, that Google did was basically bring all of their advertising platforms into one, into the Google marketing platform, a more comprehensive, holistic stack to, at, to offer to advertisers. And the thing that is great about, about the way that they did this is that Google's able to offer a full customer lifecycle or marketing funnel um, offering to the marketplace, unlike anyone else is able to do. Facebook's kind of stuck in this early awareness phase where if you're an advertiser trying to bring awareness about the product or service you're you're selling Facebook's a pretty good place but if you're looking to convert customers if you're try, trying to drive direct response right now Facebook's not so great for that Google on the other hand is great for both YouTube is great for awareness because people consume more video content today than they did five years ago and All we're right. expecting in five years uh, there will be eight percent growth in video consumption on a weekly basis by US users so I'm not really concerned okay. about about the YouTube business going forward all right, uh, good to hear your perspective. Forrester's Colin Colburn estimizes Lee Drogan. Thank you both. We're going to continue to monitor the call and bring you any additional headlines. Coming up, she calls herself a hardcore, card-carrying Tennessee conservative. Senator Marsha Blackburn has big thoughts on big tech. We're going to hear from her next. This is Bloomberg. Now back to our continued look at how the U.S. government is regulating big tech. This week, the Department of Justice announces opened a broad antitrust investigation into the tech industry. Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn heads the Senate Judiciary Tech Task Force and spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston about whether big tech has gotten too big. Well, this is a bipartisan group. It's open to every member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Chairman Lindsey Graham said, all right, we need to make certain everybody's got the institutional knowledge and that we're all on the same page as we begin to look at all the different facets and tentacles with privacy and data security and antitrust and competition and transparency and censorship and prioritization, all of those online issues that affect everyone as they have moved more of their transactional life online and as companies have set up platforms that allow consumers in that B2C relationship to have more of that functionality online. So. We got the task force started last week. It is bipartisan. Our first topic was transparent, uh, was privacy. And we had the global privacy leaders uh, from Snap, Match, Salesforce, and Mozilla. 
to come before us and to lay out what they're doing and how they're approaching privacy and uh, talk with us about how they would see a privacy structure. We talked about some of their vulnerabilities and some of their successes. So, Senator, it hasn't always been clear, at least to me, that big tech was paying much attention to what was going on at Capitol Hill. Right. Have you finally gotten their attention? Because we had, as you know, <laughs> Facebook earnings out yesterday. And in the earnings call, they said, you know, we're going to take down some of our forward revenue growth projections because of the possibility of increased competition. And as a matter of fact, the stocks seem to trail off because of that. Do you have a sense that they're finally paying attention to you? Yes, we've been working on this issue, believe it or not, for seven years. That is when we did the Privacy and Data Security Working Group over in the House at the Energy and Commerce Committee. I chaired that, led that also. Here is what I think has happened. The American public, the online public, has finally realized that when they are on all of these social media apps, they are the product because these apps and these uh, interfaces are they are data mining you, whether it is YouTube or Facebook or Google, the revenue stream for them is in your data. And these companies, these social media platforms are really big advertising companies because they sell your data to third parties and you don't know that they are benefiting from your data. The better, more high quality the data is, the more money they make. So, so Senator, I read just in the paper today about some people watching talk about the possibility of requiring big uh, data companies, big uh, social media companies to actually pay for those data, pay for those of us who might be on Facebook or on Twitter or on Google. Is that a serious possibility that Congress might take action that require them to people to pay for the data yeah, they're getting? This is, this is something that has been batted around for a while. And uh, the companies say, well, we're giving you a free service, so no, we're not going to pay you for, for your data. But here's where, why privacy is so important. You need to to give the consumer the ability to opt in to protections for their uh, personally identifying information, their sensitive information, and let them opt in if they want you to share that with a third party. You need to give them the ability to opt out and prohibit you from sharing your non-sensitive information, which is many times transactions or uh, searching that they are doing online. So, that would change the business model of, of the social media platforms. So, Senator, finally, give us a sense of the timeline, if you can. We, as I said, we have the Department of Justice now starting an investigation. You've right. got your task force going. Which will give us results sooner, do you think? Uh, we're going to be giving you results on a rolling basis. I think it is highly possible that this fall you're going to see privacy legislation move forward. My Browser Act, uh, which puts in place one set of rules for the ecosystem, one regulator, opt-in, opt-out component. Uh, it is bipartisan, and uh, you're going to have Judiciary Committee, Commerce Committee looking at these issues. I think you'll see something soon. Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn there. Coming up, Amazon falling in after hours trading largely on a profit miss. Analysts worried the company will return to a big spending cycle to expand same-day delivery as e-commerce competitors turn up the heat. More next, this is Bloomberg. Tech, I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Back to our top story this hour. Tech earnings, as we stated earlier, Amazon's profit and forecast fell short of estimates under continued pressure from efforts to shorten delivery times. Before the report, Wall Street doubled down on the company. Most analysts advised clients to buy into Amazon's earnings, citing expected strong revenue growth and operating income. Let's go to Andrew Lipsman, analyst for eMarketer from Chicago. I've also got Jatendra Rawal on set with me here in San Francisco of Bloomberg Intelligence. Andrew, does this all have to do with the continued investment in shortening delivery t times, warehouses, logistics, et cetera? I think that's a big part of it. And obviously, they, they talked about the $800 million commitment for the quarter. So we knew that that was going to weigh on earnings. Um, but I think AD AWS is the bigger story here. We saw that decline to 37% growth. 
Um, first time we saw that dip below 40%, and given how much that contributes to operating profit, I think that is um, maybe potentially the canary in the coal mine. It could also just be a one quarter blip here, um, but that's something that I think is, is maybe a little bit more concerning to investors as we go forward. Jitendra, would you agree? Yeah, so AWS numbers were uh, the weaker part, but we are forgetting how uh, good the revenue beat was. So the spending that they're doing, one day shipping is expensive, but it, it is showing signs of payoff. With AWS margins actually uh, coming a little bit weaker, that is one concern over there. Is it because of international expansion or is there is this competition? Uh, we, we think it's more about the expansion part, but actually if you look at their cost structure uh, this quarter, uh, marketing cost really jumped uh, quite a bit, 48%. That's highest we have seen growth uh, in, in a good seven years, really. So they're spending a lot more in marketing as well. So they break down marketing? Is it marketing for AWS? They, they give you a breakdown of advertising uh, portion, not in the quarterlies, in the, in the uh, main filings. But, uh, and Amazon spends like more than $8 billion. They spent more than $8 billion last year in advertising and promotional activities. But that growth is something to think about. Like, is, it, is this marketing going in terms of one day shipping? Is it Prime Day related? Or is it like, are they uh, trying to sort of fight back? Here. Um, Andrew, it's interesting uh, singling out AWS given that we were just talking earlier about Google's cloud business and how it is still in third place, though the cloud business in general is continuing to grow and it's certainly not a zero sum game. But what do you think the slowdown uh, or, or, or the disappointing numbers have to do with? Is it because of competition or, or is it because of Amazon specific issues? I don't think it's Amazon specific issues so much as it's it's really the competition. I mean, Microsoft's cloud business is up over 60% recently, so we know that that business is on fire. Um, but I think the stalking horse here is Google. I mean, that we don't have a lot of visibility into those numbers, but you do hear that under new leadership, there's some signs of life here. So if that becomes a really strong third player, um, you know, now Amazon's competing with the two giants. I think that that absolutely can eat into that top line going forward. What about Amazon's advertising business, Jatendra, which has been slowly growing, slowly becoming, uh, you know, a third place contender to Google and Facebook in the digital ad market, and it has, you know, widely been acknowledged as, as one of the biggest threats to Google and perhaps a bigger threat long term than Facebook. Yes, yeah, so the growth has been consistent this quarter uh, compared to last quarter. Obviously, the numbers look a little uh, low because of their accounting change issue that they had last year. But you know, now Amazon's going to get more aggressively into video advertising. Uh, they have all these devices out there, uh, and uh, you're going to see uh, them push harder. The, the interesting thing over here is we thought uh, advertising boom could offset some of the shipping costs, but clearly it's more expensive to ship uh, faster. Uh, so that'll be a sort of a near-term overhang on profits, but as far as they're showing that it works and it's uh, not structural, the profit growth story will resume. So let's talk about what's gonna happen in the second half of the year. We're listening in on uh, the earnings call right now and the CFO, CFO Brian Olsowski said the company did spend more than what they had said they would, $800 million on the same day delivery initiative and that it's been more difficult to execute than expected. I can sort of echo that as a customer when I've tried same day delivery on Amazon, it often doesn't work out. Andrew, what are you gonna be watching there? Yeah, well, so the top line growth was really driven by uh, the commerce business. And the, usually, I mean, really what I was expecting is to see that investment start to pay off in Q3 and really in Q4. So if we're already seeing an acceleration in Q2, um, we could really be looking at ahead to just an explosive Q4 for Amazon. As, uh, as, because consumers have to develop the habit, um, and that habit, you know, they're not really feeling the impact of that one-day delivery, especially as it continues rolling out. Those habits will get ingrained, you know, in Q3, and then really cement themselves in Q4. So I think that's where we we'll really see the upside there. Jitendra, how big an impact is the competition having? Walmart, Target, all these other big companies that are trying to up their shipping competition as well, shorten their yeah. delivery times as well, yeah. although certainly none yet compares to Amazon. 
So if you look at physical store sales for Amazon, if you look at Whole Foods performance, it's single digits. Uh, expectations have not changed. It's still expected to be single digits. They're still trying to figure out this is going to be a long tail. And uh, you know they have a lot of work to do to catch up to Walmart. Uh, but having said that, with, uh, with respect to their growth and commerce business, you know one interesting thing that stood out was their first party sales actually accelerated uh, versus third party uh, or quarter or quarter. And that was interesting to see. I don't know if it's a function of the free shipping being prioritized somewhere or is it like a change in strategy but that's definitely something to sort of look at what's happening with that mix shift so uh, Andrew let's talk about the rest of the year obviously going into the holiday quarter uh, lots of uh, acceleration is going to be happening you've got cyber Monday you've got Black Friday you've got all of this competition ratcheting up how do you expect Amazon to perform relative to the competition in the e-commerce unit in particular yeah so I think there's a few things that really advantage Amazon in Q4 particularly in light of the one-day shipping initiative so um, I don't know if a lot of folks are, are thinking about this just yet but we get into a really compressed holiday season last year we had 32 days between Thanksgiving and Christmas. This year it shrinks to 27 days. So that really advantages someone like Amazon. Um, we always see Amazon increase their share later into the season as consumers don't maybe have the same confidence of getting their deliveries on time with other retailers, but they do with Amazon. So I think uh, that compressed season is really gonna be to Amazon's advantage. So that's another element of upside in Q4. So Jitendra, what are you gonna be watching? So spending cycle, uh, which will continue, uh, obviously they are learning while, while it goes, but if the volume is just too high and how they manage this balance of one day shipping versus the other, and how long will this overhang last, you know, that's something that investors will watch for in the second half. Well, if you were curious, Jeff Bezos, who of course is the world's richest man, his net worth fell by $1.6 billion today and today alone. Now, it's interesting, Andrew, there was a lot of optimism going into this quarter. You know, there was speculation that Amazon, this earnings report would help push Amazon past that $1 trillion market cap. Why didn't Wall Street see this coming? I think it comes down to AWS. Um, there is still a lot of bullishness there, and there is really no reason to doubt it. Um, and I was watching closely to see if the, the ratchet up competition, I felt like there was a moment that was lingering out there. I didn't know when it would happen, but the increased competition was going to start to hit that top line. Again, we don't know if this is just a, a one month blip or something that might be sustained, uh, but certainly that uh, could, uh, could significantly affect the margin profile as we go into the next few quarters. All right, Andrew Lipsman of eMarketer and Jatender Wawal of Bloomberg you. Intelligence. Thank you both. We're continuing to monitor the Alphabet investor call that's underway as well as Amazon's. Here is CEO Sundar Pichai on the company's growth after an earnings report that saw a big revenue beat. Another area where we are investing deeply is YouTube. Every day, users come to YouTube to learn new things. As a result, YouTube has become one of the world's most accessible educational platforms. We see strong growth in a number of areas. Creators continue to build engaged fan bases on YouTube. Channels with more than 1 million subscribers grew by 75% year over year. And Google CFO, Ruth Poor at Alphabet CFO, I should say, broke down the total cost of revenue. Take a listen. Total cost of revenues, including TAC, which I will discuss in the Google segment, was 17.3 billion, up 25% year on year. Other cost of revenues on a consolidated basis was 10.1 billion, up 35% year over year, primarily driven by Google related expenses. Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat there, along with Google CEO Sodar Pichai, continuing to speak on the earnings call. And sticking with results, Comcast second quarter profit beat analyst estimates. This after new high-speed internet customers offset the loss of traditional cable TV subscribers. The cable giant lost 224,000 video subscribers but gained 209,000 broadband subscribers in the quarter. Coming up, e-cigarette maker Juul, the latest company to feel Washington's ire. We're going to look at their testimony on Capitol Hill today. This is Bloomberg.
Executives from e-cigarette maker Juul have been testifying on Capitol Hill on their role in, quote, youth nicotine's epidemic. U.S. lawmakers scrutinizing the company's marketing, health claims, and its relationship with big tobacco, namely tobacco giant Altria, which invested nearly $13 billion in Juul Labs late last year. The committee chair summed up lawmakers' concerns. The most important task ahead of us today is to help prevent youth e-cigarette use and nicotine addiction. But to effectively do so, we must trace the origins that led to this epidemic, expose the health risks associated with vaping, and hold accountable anyone and everyone who knowingly put children in harm's way. Federal law bans the sale of e-cigarettes to those under 18. With more on what the hearings have revealed, our Bloomberg Tech reporter Ellen Hewitt is with me. And, and you watched the hearings today. How does this sort of compare to the fiery big tech hearings on Capitol Hill last week? It was certainly a little testy at times. You could tell that there were certain members of Congress who were there at the hearings questioning these dual executives with very much the, the point of trying to show that they had lied about their earlier intent to market to teens, or at least now they were maybe trying to reframe it as like, you know, pointing out all the ways that Juul has um, tried to prevent teen usage and youth usage of their products. Um, and there were other members of Congress who were more sympathetic to Juul's mission and stated mission of trying to help adult smokers switch away from combustible cigarettes. Um, and for their part, the Juul executives were very firm in maintaining that they had never intended to market to children or to youth um, under 18 and that they had been pushing for in you know, a ban of e-cigarettes um, for anyone under 21 and, and that they, they have basically been trying to make this tool for adults and that the youth epidemic is something they're very concerned about and would love to have no youth ever using their product. Now, the co-founder did testify today, James Monsey. So let's take a listen to what he had to say. We have met with many of our sharpest critics and have sought their suggestions for how we can improve. We, are, we remain open to their input. We are committed to cooperating with this committee, state attorneys general, and other officials who wish to examine our practices. And we are dedicated to, to learning from our mistakes and not repeating them. In doing so, we hope to earn the trust of this committee, Congress, our regulators, our customers, and the American public. Now, he testified that they never intended for young people to use this, correct? Yeah. And yet. Their flavors were like bubble gum and, you know, things that certainly <laughs> appeal more to children. I don't than know to that adults. they ever went very far with any flavor that resembled bubble gum. <laughs> Often the flavors that are cited that were very popular jewel flavors among um, kids are mango or cream or mint. Um, and, and sometimes it's part of the confusion, and this came up in the hearing, part of the confusion about flavors sometimes comes from counterfeit dual products or dual compatible products made mm -hmm. by other companies that often have these more aggressively youth focused flavors and so you know Juul has often mentioned that one of the efforts they take very seriously now is trying um, to crack down on counterfeit Juul like products that that sometimes have these these flavors that make parents concerned so the CEO did not testify why is that well, that was a question that came up in the hearing, and we didn't really get a great answer. Um, I think part of it, you know, it was still helpful to hear the co-founder, James Monsey, speak. They also had another exec named Ashley Gould. She's the chief administration officer. And these people, you know, James has been around since the very beginning. I think there was relevance in asking him what were some of the original intents of the company. You know, this was something that was started many years ago when um, James and his co-founder Adam Bowen were graduate students at Stanford. They're both smokers and they were thinking, you know, how do we create a product that is different from combustible cigarettes, which we know are a leading cause of preventable death in the U.S.? Um, how do we create a product that is an alternative? And, and they do have to be very careful, to be clear, Juul is not meant to be a smoking cessation device, and that has a very specific definition under, under the FDA. So they often talk about Juul as an alternative to cigarettes, something that you can switch to, but they had to be very careful about how they framed the health benefits and, and the ability for this product to help users quit smoking. Part of the problem is the FDA has really lagged on regulating e-cigarettes, and certainly they're trying to figure out now what those regulations should be. Juul did hand over like thousands of patients of documents and internal emails showing employees having conversations, early conversations 
What did those reveal and, and, and what is next? Well, the emails were particularly interesting to look at in the context of some of the programs that Juul has done toward uh, what they call youth education programs. Um, those were meant to be programs where Juul would either sponsor people to come into schools and camps and other youth programs or send Juul representatives themselves. And these programs were meant to educate youth on dangers of cigarette smoking and also on on nicotine products. Um, and these were particularly controversial because they really mirror how Big Tobacco did similar products or similar programs for education many years ago. And you can see in these emails, Juul employees expressing concern that what they are planning to do has similarities to what you know, Philip Morris did decades ago. And, and so that was, I think, something that members of Congress were particularly interested in drilling down on, like how much did they know that these programs were something as, as they would like to say, out of the playbook of big tobacco. Right, and this as the long-term health impacts of vaping are really still largely unknown. Um, Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting. Okay, coming up, Apple cashes in its chips. More details on its acquisition of Intel's modem unit next. This is Bloomberg. Apple is buying Intel's struggling cellular modem unit in a bid to jumpstart its in-house 5G plans. The deal, valued at a billion dollars, will bring in key engineering talent and patents that will allow the iPhone giant to more quickly develop crucial components to connect its devices to the Internet. Apple hopes to eventually sever its reliance on Qualcomm parts. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Apple reporter Mark Gurman from L.A. So, Mark, uh, we knew that this was happening or in the works. Now it is official. What do we know? So we know today for sure Apple is acquiring, you know, subject to closing in the fourth quarter, Intel's modem unit. Now this is the team of engineers and patents and infrastructure that will allow Apple to sort of jumpstart its own efforts to eventually, you know, replace Intel's work and replace the work uh, of Qualcomm, who they just struck a, a royalty and licensing cross uh, agreement with. So why did Intel unload this if it's so valuable? Well, the, the issues with Intel's uh, modem unit have been long chronicled. I mean, this was really the inferior company in the all-important modem business, right? The really two big ones uh, were Qualcomm and Intel. Qualcomm was very much ahead. And that's actually why, you know, Apple struck that deal with Qualcomm earlier this year. Right now, Apple uses Intel modems, but, you know, the fact of the matter is Apple's Intel's only relevant customer. So Intel was spending so much money and resources on keeping this unit alive just for Apple, which from a business standpoint under new Intel CEO Bob Swan really did not make sense as he looks to restructure the company and make it more profitable into the future. So what kind of advantage does this give Apple in the middle of a trade war, supply chain issues, and the desire to make its own chips? Right, so building modems is you know, it's a very intense process and it comes down to two real important things. You need as many people with the engineering background to build modems as possible. You need the infrastructure, the wireless testing environments and the partnerships with the cellular carriers and you need the patents. So Intel had two of those things, right? They had the people, Apple's getting over 2,200 engineers to work on modems now from Intel, plus the important patents. And we saw why patents were so important here given their little cold war with Qualcomm they've had over the past couple of years. What Apple did already have was the devices to put this in, the infrastructure for testing, that you know technological environment to build these modems. They opened up an office in San Diego recently, plus the relationships for testing with wireless carriers globally to actually make this happen. Meantime, you're getting new dribbles from the supply chain, especially as we push towards the expected uh, unveiling of new iPhones later this year in the midst of of the trade war and you know, macroeconomic instability what are suppliers planning for when it comes to volumes this fall 
Suppliers, according to our story, are anticipating iPhone units in numbers between 75 million and 80 million to be produced and sold, perhaps, in the second half of the year. Now, Apple's second half of the year is the, you know, the fourth quarter and the first quarter for 2020. Now, 75 to 80 million units would practically be in line with what they were aiming for last year. We don't know what Apple sold precisely because they stopped reporting unit sales as those started to turn negative. So this is going to either be a really small increase, a really small decrease, but what I would call an average of flat, which is actually good news given all the pessimism around the iPhone uh, in the last several quarters. All right. Well, I know you're going to be busy reporting everything we can expect to see in the new iPhones that you haven't already uh, come in this, we assume, September. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, thank you as always. Salesforce has unveiled a new partnership with Alibaba Group to enter the Chinese software market. The move comes despite the U.S.-China trade war. The software maker will use Alibaba's cloud to sell its products. San Francisco-based company wants to double revenue by 2023. And to recap, our two big earnings stories today, Alphabet and Amazon on opposite ends of the spectrum. Amazon reporting second quarter profit missed estimates. Didn't stop there. It saw the same reflected in its third quarter guidance. It was a different story, however, for Google as shares surged as revenue beat estimates. Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat explained to investors what expenses looked like in this rebound quarter. Other income and expense was $3 billion, reflecting sizable gains, which are primarily unrealized from investments made by Capital G, GV, and more broadly at Alphabet. We provide more detail on the line items within OINE in our earnings press release. All right, that's Alphabet and Amazon, Big Tech for the Week. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.